Thank you very much for this very nice introduction. I'm very pleased that I've been given this opportunity to give this lecture. I will talk about the physics and dosimetry of hadron therapy. If you look at ionizing radiation of interest for external radiation therapy, we have first photons, charge zero, indirect ionization, it's like a mosquito. Then we have electrons, charge minus one, direct ionization, mass 512 kV, it's like a fly. Then we have pions, pi minus. Uh, pi minus are unstable. The pion is absorbed by the nucleus and the pi minus rest mass of 140 MeV appears in the form of kinetic energy of nuclear fragments, except for about 40 MeV, which is used for overcoming the binding energy of the nucleus. Mass is 138 MeV. It's like a bicycle. Then we have neutrons, charge zero, as you know, indirect ionization mass 938 MeV, like a motorbike, and protons, charge plus one, direct ionization, mass is uh, 938 MeV, it's like a shopper. Then we have the monster track, the carbon ions, which charge plus six, direct ionization, and the mass is around 12 times the mass of the protons. These particles have, or this radiation, have quite different depth of distributions. The gamma rays and fast neutron beams uh, deposit most of the energy just after entering the human body, similar with the X-rays, while ions such as proton beams and heavy ion follow this called Bragg curve and deposit most of the energy just before they stop. So one can deposit high dose inside the human body and sparing healthy tissue before that. The pi minus have similar depth of distribution as the ions because they interact with the oxygen and so on in the body and cause a high LT short range fragments like carbon and protons, C alphas, nitrogen, and boron. Because it's called star. The depth of distribution of electrons reminds about uh, the depth of distribution of an X rays. And so on. Then we have the, uh, the hadrons. They are the neutrons, protons, carbon ions. Hadrons are subatomic particles made of two or more quarks held together by the st strong interaction. And we will concentrate on the proton and the carbon ions. Dosimetry, we will talk about dosimetry. And dosimetry is the determination of absorbed dose in matter or tissue resulting from exposure to ionizing radiation. So this is the NAD per mass unit. The unit is joule per kilo, which is the same as gray. But that, why do we care about dosimetry then? The need for this symmetry. Yeah, if you look at tumor control probability and normal tissue complication probability, the slopes for TCP and NTCP are quite steep and the therapeutic window is quite narrow. So due to the steep slopes of TCP and NTCP, a 5% dose error can lead to a TCP change of 10 to 20% and even more for NTCP. So it's very important for symmetry. And the movement and changes in the body makes it especially challenging. And of course, we need good dosimetry and good imaging system so we can take advantages of the sharp Bragg peak and the spread out Bragg peak and make sure we really get the highest dose where we have the tumor and sparing the healthy tissue. But before we will go into the dosimetry and its challenges in hardened therapy, let's look at the basic physics of hardened therapy. Let's go back and see again the physical advantage of ion beams. The request of the radio oncologist is to destroy the tumor tissue, of course. So you want to spare the healthy tissue and you want to have all cell killing where you have the tumor. So if you look at the delivered dose as a function of penetration dose, you will have, you want zero dose where you have the healthy tissue, zero cell killing. And you want all dose of cell killing where you have the tumor and no dose to the healthy tissue beyond the tumor. And then we have, uh, the advantage of the famous Bragg curve. We see the protons, we have the Bragg peak, so we can localize the dose deep, seat in, deep in the body. So treating deep seated uh, tumor and sparing the healthy tissue before and after the tumor. And so if you look at the desired dose profile, you don't want any dose in the entry channel, everything to the tumor and no dose to the critical organs after the tumor. Well, in photon therapy, we get actually most dose before, if you have a deep seated tumor, after a couple of centimeters into the body, we get a little less to the tumor, but we'd also get after the tumor where we might have critical organs. 
if we superimpose many Bragg curves for proton therapy, we get a spread out Bragg peak where we had a tumor and we get less dose in the entrance channel where we had a healthy tissue and we get basically no dose to the critical organs after the tumor. But we have to look at the interactions of protons with matter to understand the physics and the dose distributions. Protons interact with electrons mediated by the Coulomb force. We have excitation and ionization. It also interacts with the nucleus mediated by Coulomb and nuclear forces. We have multiple Coulomb scattering, small angles. We'll come back to that. Elastic nuclear collisions, large angles, and inelastic nuclear interactions. The mean electron energy is very low, and the mean energy, electron energy is independent of proton kinetic energy. The interaction probability is higher for slower protons. If you look at the particle beams, in for, we have, for particles, we have nearly no attenuation. This is a difference from the photons. A heavy charge particle endures, endures multiple interactions through matter, but stays in the beam because it deflected only slightly. It loses only a small fraction of its energy in each interaction, except in rare nuclear interactions, until it stops. That is called continuous slowing down. So it uh, deposits most energy near the end. This is the Bragg curve and the Bragg peak. So we have the fluence is nearly constant until the end. And then we have the dose is low in the entrance channel, and it delivers most of the dose just before it stops. But how do we calculate the one dimensional depth dose distribution then, the Bragg curve? We first have to look at linear stopping power. And the linear stopping power consists of three components. We have electronic or collision stopping power. We have nuclear stopping due to elastic column scattering. And we have radioactive stopping power due to emission of Bremsstrahlung in the electric field, so the particles in the material traversed. This is only important for ions extremely high energies. So the Linear energy stopping is a loss of energy E of a charged particle per unit path tense X. And the linear stopping power is the unit MeV per centimeter or more common KV per micrometer. This example of stopping power is a function of specific energy. We have carbon 12 electronic stopping power, carbon 12 nuclear stopping and proton electronic stopping. And we can see how the carbon 12 electronic stopping is totally dominated in the, for the energies uh, of interest for the radiation therapy. We have the nuclear stopping power is very low. Stopping, uh, the, the nuclear stopping power is for very low specific energies and still very low compared to electronic stopping power. And we have the electronic stopping power of protons. The nuclear stopping power is negligible. So within the range of therapeutically relevant energies for protons and carbon ions, the process of energy loss is dominated by electronic collisions and can be described by the beta block formula, which is quite accurate for incident energies larger than around one MeV per nucleon. This is the beta block formula. Sometimes the correction factors are written a little differently. I will not go into the details of the beta block formula, but I just want to emphasize that it's uh, minus GDX is proportional to one over beta squared. Beta is the velocity of the particle of the velocity speed of light. And this leads to that decreased velocity gives an increased values of minus GDX, which means that most of the energy is deposited just before the particle stops. So let's look at the linear energy transfer. When we talk about linear energy transfer, mostly we, talk, we, we consider the unrestricted linear energy transfer. The unrestricted linear energy transfer is the amount of energy deposit per unit length, pass length of a material as the charged particle traverses the material. So unrestricted LT as the unit MeV per centimeter or more commonly KV per micrometer. So stopping power is the energy the particle is losing per pass length and the linear energy transfer, how much is transferred to the target. So for unrestricted LT is, is the same as the stopping power. The unrestricted LT is independent of radial dose distribution. That means it's only the energy transferred to the target material from point A to point B. As independent of the radial distribution of the delta electrons, the secondary electrons. The 
that uh, the if how far the delta electrons travel is kinematically uh, co uh, correlated to the velocity of the particle, because if the higher velocity of the particle, the delta electrons will transverse more far away from the track, and that means the ionization density along the tracks will be less. If the vel velocity is low, even if the same unrestricted LT, the delta electrons is going a shorter distance from the track, so the ionization density is higher. So LT is not a good way to really look at the biological effect because it doesn't say how the ionization density is. It can be different ionization density along the track, the same LT, depending on how far away the, below, uh, the delta electrons go. So the stopping power is the same as the negative unrestricted LT, and we see for therapeutic beams, the electronic stop LT is dominated. So if you look at the stopping power kV per micrometer as a function of kinetic energy of the particle, we see here we have protons, helium, carbon, oxygen, neon. We see that the stopping power is much higher for higher charged particles. The LT is going up with the charge and increasing also with decreasing velocity. One often talk about mass stopping power. Mass stopping power is the lin linear stopping power divided by the density and has the unit MeV square centimeter divided by gram. And the dose from the charged particle in some medium, for example, water can be expressed by this uh, formula where theta here is the particle fluence. So integral from zero to E zero, ddx divided by density multiplied by fluence, d is the dose recharge particles. So now we can calculate the depth dose distributions, but only for the primary particles in ideal case. We have the column interactions, we have the ideal case for the primary particles, but then we have also energy straggling. So far we used the continuously slowing down approximation, CSDA. The beta block formula gives the mean energy lost per unit path length. But in reality, ions lose their energy in individual collisions with electrons, and the actual energy loss will scatter around the mean value. And this energy loss distribution is not Gaussian around the mean. The stochastic behavior of energy deposition in matter means the energy straggling is described as stochastic distribution, such as lambda varvelo distribution. And lambda varvelo distributions have a tail, so it's not the Gaussian. So then we have the column interaction, we have the range straggling, but we have something more. What is that? Yeah, we have nuclear interactions of protons. Because a certain fraction of protons have nuclear interaction in tissue, about 1% of all protons per centimeter of penetration mostly with oxygen and carbon nucleus. The nuclear interaction causes a decrease in primary proton fluence, and nuclear interactions lead to secondary particles and thus to local and non-local depositions, those depositions, especially the neutrons, which travel more far away and cause indirectly also uh, dose because it's reacting with the charged particle and cause charged particles. So the dose from nuclear interaction is negligible in the Bragg peak. It's totally dominated by the primary uh, uh, particles, but the target fragments have high LT and therefore high relative biological effectiveness and can cause normal tissue complication along the plateau region for the healthy tissue. They have high LT, short range, but it's important uh, along the pass uh, where before the Bragg peak. So here's a spatial distribution. You have the total energy deposit and this is a contribution in percent for primary protons. You have secondary protons fragmentation, target fragmentation, and alpha recall from target fragmentation. And we can see this contribute in the entrance channel where you have a healthy tissue. So that's one need to consider that also. So let's look at the external beam therapy. You have the beam, in the ideal case, all the dose of cell killing will occur at the place where you have the tumor. But if you have photons, we know that you get extra dose before and after the tumors. Uh, protons have much better dose localization, and we get most dose where you have the tumor. Then you can, of course, shooting in the photons from any direction, intensity modulated photon therapy. 
but even then you will uh, have quite a high dose before and after the uh, tumor. If you're shooting in proton for seven directions, you will get much better dose localization. So if you compare photon versus protons, beam for beam, you can always do a better job with particles, except at the surface. For example, you treat malignant melanoma. If you look at particle range versus energy, this is a range in water, it's functional kinetic energy of particles. You can calculate this also from the stopping power formula. You integrate from zero to E, one over minus ddx d, and then we can see to reach a range suitable to be able to treat all organs in the body, you need like 35 centimeters, 34, 35 centimeter. Then you need like 230, 40 MeV, maybe 250 MeV for the protons. But for the carbon ions, you need up to 400 MeV or 450 MeV to reach most places in the body. These also have uh, the consequence that for protons, you need only cyclotrons, but for heavy charge particle, you need synchrotrons, you need more advanced and more complicated, larger and more expensive accelerators. If you look at the dose dependence on depth, we have seen there's nearly no attenuation. There's a big difference from photons. Along the path, the fluence stays constant, except near the end of the ranges of the ions. Ions lose energy gradually. You have energy loss per ion pair stays same. The ion pairs per unit length increases. And increase in LT in the ratio between biological dose and physical dose, that means increase in RB at the end of the Bragg curve. So you have an increase in RB at the Bragg peak. And the electron energy is low, so it's no build up like you have for, for example, uh, X rays. But you have multiple coolant scatter. The ions are deflected in the electric field on the nuclear. In general, multiple deflections will occur for each ion. And these play a key role in determining the lateral dose distributions. So this is a proton pencil beam. You start with the pencil beam, but the scattering increase with a decreasing velocity. And in the end, you will have a phenomena and not a pencil beam. And the multiple coolant scattering can be described with my Moliere theory. The definite theory of multiple coolant scattering was published by Moliere in 1947. It has no empirical parameter and covers arbitrary thick scatterings. It's a great theory, I think. The angular distribution at large angles fall off roughly as one over theta raised to the four, but it's nearly Gaussian for small angles. This is sigma multiple coolant scattering as a function of depth for protons at different energy. You have 100. 60 MeV protons and 200 MeV protons. And we can see here at the same depth that the higher energy protons will have less multiple coolant scattering. It, the multiple coolant scattering decreases with increasing particle energy. So the lateral phenomena changes in depth. The ions experience multiple coolant scattering, as I mentioned, each time they're deflected by a small angle, but the particle stays in the beam. The effect of the def deflection accumulates, so ions spread out laterally and the Gaussian flattens out. The beam phenomena will increases at the end of the path of the particles. At the same time, the ion energy decreases and the flexion angle increases for each interaction. So the beam phenomena increases fastest near end of the beam range, as we can see here. If you look at the proton therapy, one nowadays one use proton pencil beam scanning. That means one basically paint the tumor three-dimensional by changing the energy of the protons and changing the direction of the magnets of the beam. And then you have this three-dimensional pattern. Previously, one used the passive system with range filter, sc scatterage, range filter, reach filters, uh, boolers, etc. Uh, still some facilities use this, but uh, if you have extra material and beam line, you will cause more projectile fragmentation, fragmentation of the beam, and uh, you will cause target fragmentation, and you can get uh, neutrons, and you can get more dose for the, to the healthy tissue, so you get more normal tissue complications. Let's look at pediatric cancer, for example, medulloblastoma, which is representative for the superior dose distribution using particles. 
This is when you treat medulloblastoma, the intention is to treat only the spinal cord and the brain. And we can see here when you use X-ray beam, you, have, you get quite a lot of dose to the healthy tissue, not only the spinal cord and the brain. The proton beam, you get much better dose localization on the spinal cord and the brain. So the absolute risk of secondary cancer is significantly de uh, decreased. If you compare proton with standard X-ray, you see that uh, standard X-ray have nearly 15 times higher probability for secondary cancer. Of course, this is not absolute values, this is estimated values. If you look at the IMRT, intensity modulator radiation therapy, we see that the estimated uh, risk, higher risk with the protons is, with photons, excuse me, is around nine times higher risk to get secondary cancer for children getting treatment with IMRT compared with the proton which because of the good dose localization and the minimize dose deposition in the healthy tissue. Now I said proton has a good dose localization. Why do we care about carbon? Why carbon therapy? Yeah, I mentioned before the range straggling. The variance of the range straggling is related to the energy loss. And the width of the range straggling can be expressed by this formula, where M and E are the projectiles mass and energy. The one over uh, squared M, it was, uh, one over uh, over uh, this uh, depends on the cost protons to have a higher straggling uh, than light ions, but a factor of 3.5 with respect to the carbon ions. So the protons have much higher levels of straggling respect to the carbon ion, and therefore a much wider Bragg peak, broader Bragg peak. So let's compare, we saw earlier the, the desired dose profile. You have no dose to the entrance channel. You have, you, you, you want to have all those to the tumor. You don't want to have any to critical organs. Photon therapy, you get most dose, a couple of centimeter into the patient. You get less to the tumor. You get also the critical organ of the tumor. Proton therapy, if you superimpose and create a, a spread out drag peak, you get a plateau region with high dose and you get less in the entrance channel and nearly no into critical organs after the tumor. But in carbon therapy, you get even less in the entrance channel for the same tumor dose. But you get also some dose after the tumor. Uh, and this can hit potential critical organs. And why is it so? Yeah, because this is nuclear reactions again. I mentioned protons, you have target fragmentation, but, uh, because, but in carbon ion therapy, you have six protons, six uh, neutrons. So the projectile is also fragment. Carbon ion therapy is around 120 to 400 MeV per nucleon. And for the therapy, we have to know all interaction event. That means all particles, all generation, fluences, versus and energy, et cetera, et cetera. Because the projectile, the carbon hits the target, and you have interaction with the tissue and organs in the body. You create target fragments and projectile fragments. So you get a new mixed radiation field inside your body. The target fragments have lower charges than the target, high LTs, short ranges. Projectile fragments have lower charges than the primaries, mixed LETs, and some of them have long ranges and can therefore penetrate beyond the tumor and cause this tail in the Bragg curve. So you have high, this is example, high energy carbon beam stopping in water. And this is uh, treatment of a brain tumor. And we have the one field carbon ions hitting the tumor here. And we can see this dose after the tumor, which is caused by the projectile fragments. So it's very interesting, uh, important to understand the physics, understand what particles are created, because even if you're shooting in carbon ions into the body, uh, inside your body, you have a lot of nuclear reactions, you have target fragmentation, projectile fragmentations, and you create a new mixed radiation field. And this mixed radiation field with charged particles, neutrons, and gamma rays is a challenge for the dosimetry. So you have multiple colors scattering, we said, the heavy ions exhibit also uh, multiple colon scattering, but they exhibit more precise physical dose distribution than protons because angular and range scatterings 
are inversely proportional to the square of the atomic number. So if you compare protons at 148 MeV and carbon beams at 270 MeV per nucleon, this is Monte Carlo simulation, this is the multiple coulomb scattering, and we can see that the multiple coulomb scattering for the carbon beams are significantly less than the proton beams. So you have less straggling and less multiple coulomb scattering. So you have better dose localization with carbon beams compared to proton beams. So this is del uh, uh, sigma multiple coulomb scattering. And this is the multiple coulomb scattering depending on the particle charge. Sigma multiple coulomb scattering is function of depth. The upper curve is protons, 148 MeV, and the lower is carbon 12, 270 MeV per nucleon. And we can see at the same depth, the carbon beams have significantly less multiple coulomb scattering. Important is also that biological effects are controlled by the differences in physics and chemistry of different ionizing radiation. For example, low LT radiation, as such as photons, are uniform distributed in the cell. This example of one gray, maybe around 1,000 tracks per cell, around 100,000 ionization per cell, uniform distributed. While the charged particle travels along tracks, so you have one gray that goes three, four tracks per cell, the same number of ionization as photons, but they are concentrated on the tracks. So the ionization density is much, much higher, and this can lead to much more severe DNA damage, the cluster damages, which are difficult to repair and can cause misrepair, mutation, and cancer. So if you look at cell survival as a function of LAT, this is survival fraction as a function of dose for the different LAT, X-rays, 15 MeV neutrons and alpha ray. And we can see here when you're increasing LAT, the surviving fraction is much less for the same dose. So if you compare X rays, same dose, Turad, with alpha rays, the surviving fraction for alpha rays are much lower. So high LAT particles are much better of killing cells. I think. So if we look at radiation types and the damaged DNA, we have the double strand DNA. The X-ray is low LAT radiation, cause most repairable single and double strand breaks. Proton is in between X-ray and carbon ions. Carbon ions is a high LAT radiation, cause complex DNA lesions, multiple DNA pathways, more difficult to repair and enhance the cell death, can cause uh, severe cluster damages. One important effect is the indirect effect, which is when the ionizing radiation is interacting with water molecules, create free radicals, and the free radicals are attacking DNA. This is in addition to the direct effects when the radi ionizing radiation is interacting directly with the DNA. The radical formation and, and the amount of oxygen is very important for low LT radiation, such as gamma rays and electrons. So one talk often about oxygen enhancement ratio, which is defined as the dose to produce a certain effect under hypoxic condition divided by the dose to produce the same effect under oxic conditions. You can see here we have surviving fraction as a function of dose, and the red curve is anoxic cells and green is well oxygenated cells. And we can see that anoxic cells have much higher survival per unit of dose than oxic cells that well oxygenated cells show a much steeper cell surviving curve. So for the same dose, if you have presence of oxygen, you have much lower surviving fractions, much higher cell death for low LT radiation because of the indirect effects, the uh, oxygen, uh, amount of oxygen is important. So if you look at cell survival, if you look at carbon, 275 MeV per nucleon uh, compared with photons, you have seen the depth distribution of photons. One good thing with carbon ions is that you have low cell survival rate at the Bragg peak. So the low cell survival is just at the Bragg peak. And this is not the case for all heavy ions because of the heavier ions than carbon, you have more fragmentation, you have a larger tail, and this cause high LT, short range particles, and the lowest uh, survival rate is shifted from the Bragg peak. So let's look at RBE as a function of LAT and OAR as a function of LAT. The RB is defined as the dose in X for X-rays at 250 kV divided at with a dose for the test radiation at the same ISO effect.
questions. I apologize again for the <laughs> problems at the beginning. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Lambit, for the very impressive and detailed talk. And let's give the floor to Christophs for the Q&A sessions for the students. Yeah. Uh, so we have our first question from Philippa. Hi, hello. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, now at, the, at one of the uh, last slides, you mentioned the LET measurement. I was just curious how, how that actually works. So because we meant, you talked Wait. about measuring those, so how, how we would be able to measure LET in uh, LET, uh, you can measure LET both with the passive and the active detectors. You can measure passive detector with nuclear track edge detectors, which is uh, basically yeah, the plastic detector, which uh, uh, leaves tracks, which you can see after etching in sodium hydroxide at an elevated temperature. And with a microscope, you can see the tracks and the shape and uh, the size of the tracks are, are proportional to LET. You can also use uh, uh, pixelized silicon detector like uh, time picks, mini picks, and other pixelized detectors, which you can see both the charge and the LT of the, the of the particles. And there's other method also. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so our next question comes from the chat from Corey. Uh, thanks for the excellent presentation. I want to ask what energies do particles have in the fragmentation tail after the Bragg peak for carbon ions? In particular, I'm wondering about the applicability of beat block formula in this region for accurately predicting the dose beyond the Bragg peak region. It uh, depends on the particle, but the beta block formula is working fine. Uh, normally, it's working fine about one MeV per nucleon. So it depends on the fragment. Uh, you have variety. I mean, for carbon, you have the projectile fragments from carbon 11 down to protons and neutrons. So you have a wide range of energies and wide range of LETs. And this also makes it important to understand the physics to calculate exactly the depth dose distribution with all the fragments for doing a treatment planning system. But also we have to remember the dosimetry because for example, photon, you have photonuclear reactions, the dose comes from this. And if you have neutrons, you have uh, nuclear reactions, actually those comes from this. So you, it comes from different physics. So uh, it's uh, the beta block formula is, is working fine. We just need to make sure you calculate all for the simulation, you need to understand all the fragmentation reactions. You need to have all the cross section and modeling correctly. And for dosimetry, you need to make sure you, uh, you should have a tissue equivalent detector. If you have a silicon detector, you have a conversion factor, but this conversion factor, it depends on the energy and the charge of the particles. So it's kind of challenging for the dosimetry. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered the question. <laughs> Yeah, we can wait for a response from Corey in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Julie has a question. Oh, yes, can you hear me? I hope the background sound is not too yeah, bad. Yeah, we can hear you, yes. Okay, I'm, my question is mostly about the difference of the LET and the mass stopping power. Because I'm a radiobiologist and we always talk about the LET. But clearly from your presentation, um, we, the LET is, so the amount of energy that is uh, received by the medium per part length, but then the mass stopping power takes something extra into account. It takes the total kinetic energy loss. So why do we never talk about mass stopping power in radiobiology? Is it like they must also have like a biological effect? Um, yeah, I mean, the the LET, first of all, normally when people talk about LET, you talk about <clears throat> unrestricted LET. And one has to remember that then it's independent of the radial dose distribution. That means independent how far the secondary electrons go. And this is kinematically dependent on the velocity of the beam. So actually you can have the same LET, uh, which is the energy transfer for point A to point B for when a different uh, velocity of the beam. So if you have a larger, uh, lower velocity, the delta electrons go further away from the track. So you have much higher ionization density and therefore much higher 
biological effect than if you have a very high velocity and you can have the same LET, but then the delta electrons go very far away from the track. So the biological effect will be lower. So it's actually, in my point, it's not so good to talk about LET if you mean unrestricted linear energy transfer. You need to look at the microdosimetry and the track structure itself, how, uh, yeah, the, the ionization density. So not only the mass stopping power, I mean, divided by the density to calculate the dose because the dose is a microscopic uh, quantity. So I think more important when you look at biological effect is talking about uh, like microdosimetry, linear energy. I didn't talk about that and specific energy distribution, which is in a very small area, which is more related to ionization density. I mean, the track structure, how intensive it is in the track. Because again, the LET is just from the from point A to B, but it can be wide distribution of the delta electrons away from the track, or it can be very narrow, but have same LET. I'm sorry, actually, I have a track structure simulation. I should have showed some, maybe. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I guess while we wait for some other questions from the students, there was actually one uh, question in our entry forms like related to your lecture, it was uh, more on, are there any specialized detectors just for the uh, hadron therapy, proton therapy? Like, are there any different detectors compared to what we would use in conventional radiotherapy or different models? Yeah, detectors, uh, pixelized, like, I don't know if you know, time picks and medi picks, which is, uh, pixelized silicon detectors, which can give both timing, it can give charge and it can give directional information are quite good. Uh, and for models, uh, one can use, uh, of course, Monte Carlo simulations to simulate the whole beam transport. You have Fluca code, you have Giant code, you have the FITS code, which I'm part of the development team. It's a Japanese code, particle and heavy ion transport code system. And uh, most of, yeah, all of them have quite good models for calculating the, uh, the whole beam transport. And of course, when you look at a treatment planning system, often you make uh, databases not doing the whole Monte Carlo, like in ray station and ray search and so on. But if you want to do really information about LET, charge and everything, pixelized uh, silicon detector, but we, uh, even better to have a tissue equivalent detector with organic and so on uh, sensors. We are actually working on that in Prague, a project to combine silicon detectors having also organic uh, sensors, which are more tissue equivalent material. Okay. And question for me directly, uh, you mentioned, because I'm also a bit working in a related uh, things, you mentioned the target fragmentation. Yes. And I was wondering, target fragmentation versus projectile fragmentation. Do the like the cross section data that we have, do we can consider the same precision if we calculate like projectile fragmentation as the target fragmentation, or target fragmentation is harder to model? Actually, to model is not a problem. It's it, to measure. It's more difficult, but you can do experiment with inverse kinematics. I mean, uh, you can measure kind of projectile and convert it to target fragment. The, the problem with measuring the target fragment is have very short ranges. It's a couple of micrometer up to eight and ten, ten micrometer, but high LET, so difficult to measure with normal uh, detectors and so on but you can do with reverse kinematics and uh, because the target fragment and project time fragment is actually the same depending on which uh, um, reference frame you, you're looking at. So you can do projectile fragment and, and transfer it <laughs> to the target fragments in, by changing reference frame. And like I said, at a Bragg peak, it doesn't play a big role, but it contributes uh, yes, because of the, not so much to the dose, but to the dose equivalent because they have high LET in the, in the plateau region. And we have done measurements of that at HIMAC using just nuclear track edge detectors and some other. And if you're interested, I can of course send you publications and 
uh, how, what is the contribution for those equivalent along the Bragg curve uh, yes. for for different beams? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If that is possible, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as I don't see anything in the chat or Slack or any raised hands, I guess we can give a comment or question to Manjit. Monica, do we have a moment or we have to stop? Uh, I think that uh, we should just have the picture before the coffee break and we can even squeeze the coffee break uh, in order to be on time for the second part. You can comment, Manjit. Okay, so, so Lambert, many thanks. Um, question for you. You know that now, as you mentioned, there's a lot of interest in flash, okay? Yeah. And the symmetry is a big challenge. Yes. <laughs> uh, any ideas how we can meet some of these challenges in, since you have so much experience in the symmetry and measurements and LET? I have no good answer just now because it's really so high dose rate and so short time and the problem is uh, the response of the detector uh, for this high beam intensities uh, during this short. So uh, I don't think I have any really better okay. just now than, than, than okay. what other people said. It's, okay. it's a challenge. Yeah. yeah, perhaps we could have a discussion offline because yes, yes, no, I'm I happy have to... a student, Joe, who's working on this. So it would be an interesting discussion to have. Thanks a lot. Yes, I'm very welcome. We are working a lot with the different detectors in, in my lab here in Prague. So I knew that. So that's yeah. why I wanted to ask yeah. you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I okay. guess from the questions, that's it. So thank you from the student side. It was very, very interesting and informative. Actually. Thank you again. Photo, please. Thank you much. Photo, yeah. please. Stay please. in bed for the photo. <laughs> yeah. Turn on your cameras and we can take the today picture.